Hello everyone, my name is Damien and uh, I feel very lucky today uh, because two great artists, Cyril Diagne and Mario Kligman, will join me on stage in a few minutes. So you can see what they will, uh, you can see what they do when they use machine learning. So if you want to go to the bathroom or text, please do it while I'm doing the intro, but while they are there, you see the real meat is there. So I'm working for the Cultural Institute in Paris, and the mission of the Cultural Institute is to help to uh, the museum and institution to digitalize and to um, share their culture, their asset online. We are working with more than 1,000 uh, museums, and it means that if you want to discover a new museum every week, it will take you 20 years to do so. What we do at the Cultural Institute is this app. It's named the Google Culture, um, Art and Culture app. It's really a beautiful app, and if you have not downloaded it yet, uh, you should do. There are a ton of really incredible features, and one of my favorites is named Gigapixel. Gigapixel is um, done using the art camera, and the art camera is um, able to catch every detail in a painting. So every crack, every blue stuff, you can see them in the app. You can zoom in very deeply in the app to see, for instance, Terry Night. But I'm not working on this app. I'm working in a space named the lab. It's in the middle of Paris. It's a beautiful space. I feel lucky every day when I go there. And it's a space dedicated for creativity. And just uh, the fun fact is that um, it's where the cardboard is born. David Coz and I uh, used the laser cutter there to uh, create the very first cardboard, the one that was unveiled at I.O. two years ago. That's why I wear this T-shirt today. And uh, last year, we also worked at the lab. For instance, on this picture, you can see some early prototype uh, of the cardboard that uh, was unveiled at I.O. last year. But enough for the cardboard today. Um, even if I have a, still a string relationship with the VR team, I also have a small team in Paris that is um, named Silex. It stands for Cultural Institute Experiment Team. And what we do, we do experiments with uh, creative coders and artists. We are very passionate about three uh, different axes. It's, uh, we try to engage more people to um, enjoy culture. So we try to find fun way for people to watch more paintings. We try to find also a new way to organize the information so uh, our user can have a journey in, um, in our database and hopefully they can learn something out of it. And obviously, because we have 7 million assets in the database, we try to analyze them to uh, discover new insights. So this talk is about machine learning, obviously, and uh, just take 30 seconds to, uh, to remind us the definition. Just to make things simple, imagine that you are writing an algorithm to, um, to check if a picture is a cat picture. You can do it yourself by trying to analyzing all the pixels one by one, but obviously it's difficult. Or what you can do is uh, using machine learning, having an algorithm that will learn by itself uh, what are the good features to um, check if a uh, Picture, uh, the picture is a cat picture. So the, the key, I think, is this is happening now. Machine learning is not the future. Machine learning is something that everybody in this audience can do, can try. If you know how to code, you can try machine learning. For example, uh, did you know that you can create some Mario Bros. levels just uh, using a uh, no, RNN networks, or you can um, make a color movie from a black and one white, or you can uh, make a 3D movie from a 2D movie. So things that seem difficult or impossible, it's something that you can do now using machine learning and neural networks. Another example, this one is inside the brother. It's um, David A from Japan, a designer and artist, and he just decided to make these simple games with two volley players. And in fact, they play extremely well just uh, using a very, very simple neural network that he display on the screen. So because machine learning is so useful and widespread now, there is no doubt that it will have a huge impact on art and 
on artists. So that's why uh, we decided something like one year ago to create a machine, learning, a machine learning residency in the lab. So we ask artists to join us and to create great experience. So now I will lead to Mario, Mario Klingman, who is the, our latest artist in residency. Thanks, Thank Mario. you, Damien. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Mario Klingemann and I'm a code artist and it might sound like i kind of really good at indentation or write beautiful code, but that's not really what it is. Uh, it just says that I'm using code and algorithms to produce things that look interesting and some of them might even be called art, I don't know, I'm not the one to decide that. Uh, like any other artist, I have this problem, like you look around you and it looks like everything has already been done. I mean, uh, in times of Google, you come up with a great idea, you Google it and think, oh well, okay, done already. So it seems there are no empty spaces anymore, no white spaces where you can make your mark, where you can kind of be original. On the other hand, if you look at it, there are no real, humans are incapable of having original ideas. Ideas are always just a recombination of something some other people have done before. You take concept A and concept B, and the idea is finding a new connection between them. And so this is where, for me, the computer can help me finding these connections. So in theory, all I have to do is go through every possible permutation, and the computer will offer me new combinations that hopefully not have been done. And all I have to do is sit back and let the whatever it has created pass by and decide if I like it or not. So in a way, I'm becoming more of a curator than a creator. Um, I'll show you a short example. So, oh, um, this is a tool I call Ernst. It's uh, a kind of an homage to Max Ernst, uh, an artist famous uh, for his surreal collages back in the early 20th century. And what he did, he created these collages from things he found in papers, in uh, catalogs, etc. So I decided, well, maybe I built my own collage tool. And uh, in this case, I'm using assets found in the waste co collection of public domain images by the uh, Internet Archive. And I wrote me a tool that helps me to automatically cut them out. And then I say, OK, if I give you these five elements, what can you do with them? And then it produces me stuff like these. And unlike Max Ernst, I have the possibility to also scale material. So, and once, as, then you get these, if you have like pipes, you get fractal structures, things that look like plants. And the process is really like this. I have this tool with all the library elements, and then it just starts combining them in random ways. And sometimes I see something that I like. Very often I see things that are just well, horrible or uh, just uh, total chaos. But yes, sometimes there's something that looks like this. I call that, for example, Run Hipster Run. And I must say, coming up with funny titles or interesting titles is, of course, a nice perk of this way of working. But of course, there's still this problem that I still have to look through a lot of images which are just, well, just noise, just chaos. So. Wouldn't it be nice if the machine could learn what I like, what are my tastes are, or even better, what other people like, and then I can sell them like better? So I realized I have to first understand what do humans find interesting in images? Uh, what is it that makes an, one image more artful than another one? And this directed my view to this growing amount of digital archives. And uh, those are now, there are lots of museums and libraries out there that start digitizing all their old books and paintings, just like the Cultural Institute helps museums doing that. And so I first stumbled upon this about two years ago when the British Library uh, uploaded one million images that were automatically extracted from books spanning from 1500 to 1899. There was only a little kind of a, a problem with it because all these illustrations and photos were cut out automatically. So they had OCR scans and then uh, 
they knew there would be an image in a certain area, but unless you didn't look yourself at the image, you wouldn't know what's actually on it. So if you were looking for, let's say, a portrait of Shakespeare, you would have to manually go through every image until you may be stuck upon it. So I thought, hmm, that's a bit tricky. Maybe I can help them with uh, classifying their, their material and training the computer. OK, this is a portrait. This is a map. So I started, in a way, figuring out ways how I could do that. And eventually, I, I was able to tag about 400,000 images for them. I mean, this was a kind of a group effort. Everybody could join in. But working with this material, I realized, is such a joyful experience. Because in the beginning, I was just interested in the machine learning. But actually, you suddenly realize there is this gold mine, like this huge mine of, uh, of material. And sometimes, really, you, you go through lots of things that seem to be boring or you're not interested in. And then you're stuck upon a beautiful illustration or something. And uh, I. I realized that is, that is actually a, a huge part of the, the fun of the process. So for example, take this rock or stone axe. So well, once you go through this material, you start recognizing patterns. And so sometimes there comes this rock by, and you see, mm, OK, well, I don't care. But then the second one, and I say, oh, maybe I should start a, a rock collection or a rock uh, category. And then what happens is suddenly you are happy when every time you come another one of those. And then, well, what I do is I start uh, arranging them and putting them kind of in a new context. And then you start actually starting to appreciate uh, the craftsmanship that went into this, and also you can like once you put lots of very similar things together, you can much better distinguish between the, the slight differences in there. Yes, so I start doing this, for example, here on the left side, you see a piece called uh, 36 Anonymous Profiles. It's, there's all these hundreds, thousands of geological profiles, which again, you probably, if you're not interested or a geologist, you would don't, wouldn't care. But like this, it becomes a really interesting field or uh, well, it's just a way to, to bring these things that maybe sometimes have been hidden for 100 years in a book and nobody has watched them. And now you can bring them back to life. Or on the right side of his, I call 16 very sad girls. Again. I don't know why they have so many sad girls in there, but of course, again, that makes you question what was happening at that time. So it actually motivates you to search back and, well, what's the story behind this? But this all I started kind of on my own, and this, it was not, I wouldn't say it wasn't deep learning what I was doing. It was more classical machine learning, because I was always a little bit afraid of going down this path. I heard like, oh, you need expensive machines, and uh, it's kind of hard to set up the machine. So I needed something to, to get me like, motivated to go through the painful process of installing everything to get a machine learning system. Luckily, about a year ago, this came along. I don't know if you had seen this picture, but when I saw it, I thought, oh my god, this looks kind of weird, and I have never seen this before. Fortunately, about a week later, before, after this leaked, it was uh, clear, oh, some, some engineers at Google had come up with this new technique called Deep Dream, and it's based on machine learning. So, of course, I wanted to know, how can I do this myself? Fortunately, what they did, they actually shared an IPython notebook on GitHub with all the source code, even the trained model, and it was able to, to dig myself into this. Back in the days, there was no TensorFlow yet, so this was still in cafe. But this allowed me to finally kind of go by baby steps into, into learning this technique. And obviously, I started, like probably a lot of us, uh, we, I started to having a lot of fun with this. Like, you put in an image, and you wonder, oh my god, what will I get out of this? Uh, because that's what it is. You, you put something in, you had no idea what, what you would get. So this was fun for, let's say, a few, a few weeks. But then I started thinking, OK. I think I could make some improvements to this code. And well, I would call this lucid dreaming. So maybe get a little bit more control or change the outcome. So I figured out there are three points I might be able to, well, to turn it into a different direction. So the first one, I'm not sure if you noticed it, these pictures are all kind of a bit psychedelic, colorful. So that's like, I'm from Germany. We are kind of very earnest people. So I like it rather a bit toned down. So 
very simple thing, desaturate it a bit. And desaturation is super easy. So it, all I needed was to add a single line of code, which is the one you see at the bottom. What you do is you take the average between the RGB values, and then you can have a linear interpolation between the grayscale version and the color version. And depending on how crazy you want it, well, you pick a factor in the middle. And so as an example here, on the left side, psychedelic Mario. On the right, the, well, puppy face, uh, grayscale one. So, well, but second thing. Uh, well, uh, that issue about that you don't know what you will get out, or when you get something out, it will be can get a selection of slug, puppy, or eyes. So, can I get a little bit more control? Well, in the order to do that, we have to have a look at how this thing works. So this is the classic, a classic uh, convolutional network for, which is the Google Net in this case. That was also the architecture that was used for the early deep dream experiments. So what it, what you do, you put something in on the left, an image, and it passes through all these convolutional layers and uh, softmax, and well, we don't go into depth there. In the end, you get out. Uh, what the machine thinks a, a, a probability for certain categories. What Deep Dream does is you put in an image at the beginning, but then instead of going all through all the network, you stop at a certain layer. And at that layer, there are certain neurons activated. So depending on what the network thinks it sees there, it will some neurons will get activated and others will not. And what it does is then it emphasizes those activations even more and sends it back up the chain. And then this will, in a way, oops, uh, it will kind of uh, emphasize all those elements where it thought it has discovered, let's say, a cat, then it will improve the cattiness of that image. So, uh, well, if you look at it, at this, what actually happens inside this network, and I'm coming from the kind of, let's say, a pixel art background, or I'm doing lots of with bitmaps. So I look at it this way, then it's actually bitmaps all the way down. So in the top layers, you can still see there is some convolutions going on that remind you of sharpening filters or something. The deeper you go down the net, actually, it gets more and more abstract. But for me, even those dots are still little bitmaps. And then I can do stuff with them. I can and increase the brightness, reduce or the, uh, enhance the contrast, blur things. Or what I also can do, I can treat it like a, a brain surgeon in a way like I poke in and say, OK, when I poke in here, does the finger wiggle or the toe? So, and what I can do then is I can just say, well, how about if I turn every, every neuron off instead of maybe, for example, the 10 most activated ones and send it back up? The code to do that is, again, rather simple. So again, each of these little bitmaps is just, well, well, for me, it's a bitmap or it's a little array of numbers. So what I can do for each of these cells, I just sum up all the pixels in there. Then I sort them by how much they summed up to. And in the end, I just keep the top 10, for example, or if I'm just interested in a single category, the most activated one, and replace all the other values with 0 and send it back up. What I get then is something that looks like this. So it's kind of just reducing everything to a single category uh, the network thinks to have so seen. And I like these, really, because they are, again, totally out of this world. Some remind me of organic patterns. Sometimes you can see, OK, this might have come from an eye detector or so. But definitely, it, it doesn't contain any, any traces of slugs or eyes, again. So, but of course, there's still this other issue, and I call it the puppy league. Or rather, I kind of reveal why are there so many puppies in, uh, like, why, why does Deep Dream have, like, such a uh, love for puppies? Well, the reason is that uh, the network, the original network that was used for the, the first release of Deep Dream was based on the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition competition, which is kind of the Olympics of, uh, of image recognition. And in 2014, what they did, they added 150 new categories, and it was all dog breeds. So that old rule applies, gerbil in, gerbil out. So whatever you train it with, that's what you will get. 
So, well, then I thought, okay, maybe I just have to train this, uh, this network with something else. But then, I'm kind of new to it, I, I heard, heard these stories that it takes like four weeks on a super powerful GPU to train a network. And, uh, well, I'm a poor artist. I, I can't afford like an NVIDIA rack with uh, these things. So, but then I came across this technique, which is really astonishing. It's called uh, fine tuning. And what it does is you can take an already trained network, which, for example, the Google Net, and all you have to do is to cut off the, the bottom layer, and, on, and then you can retrain it with new material. And what happens is, all the top layers are pretty much the same no matter what you train it with because they look for abstract elements like edges, curvature, things like that. So that doesn't need to be retrained. So doing that, you can take a trained network, you feed in new images. Instead of taking four weeks, you can train a network overnight. And uh, the way I do it, well, I tried it with, let's, I call it MNIST with a twist. It's uh, kind of, I. In my works with these archives, I come across a lot of these decorative initials. And uh, I thought, like, hmm, OK, is there a way I could actually train it to recognize uh, A, B, C in, in these that come in all different kinds of shapes? Well, I tried. And I must admit, there is a manual process involved, because what I have to do is, uh, I f well, the way I do it, I really start folders on my hard drive and go manually and drag and drop whatever I find in this, let's say, oh, another A, I drop into the A folder. I don't have to do this with the thousands of images. Actually, it turns out I can just start with, it's enough, I take 50 for each category. If, I'm pretty sure there are people who know much more about than me about machine learning. They say, oh my god, that will never work and it will totally overfit. It doesn't matter. Actually, it works. So I start with just like, let's say, 20 to 50 images per category, and then train the network using the fine tuning technique. I let it kind of simmer for two hours, so, so it gets a little bit uh, custom to the data. And then I use this to show me what it thinks these letters are. So it, it, I train it a bit. It, I get, give it a bunch of random images, and it says, oh, I think it's an A. I say, no, it's not an A. And then it, a B, oh, yes. And actually, it gets better and better, because what I do is whenever it finds something, it gets added to my training set, and I can repeat this process. So, and uh, to, in order to, to kind of help me with this process of saying yes, no, I realized that the, the kind of left swipe, right swipe is a real popular way to decide if you are into a specimen or not. And <laughs> it's actually it's a super fast way. So I can go back and forth, and in one hour, I can already, I think I can go through a thousand images and say if, I like, if, if, they, if it's correct or not. And as a result, so for example here, this is stuff where it has correctly recognized that it's an A. And as you can see, it's quite, I mean, it's, it's really surprising. Like, it comes in so many different shapes that, uh, well, it's just uh, amazing how powerful these networks are. Uh, then sometimes it gives me something like this. And uh, I don't know, it looks like a ruin to me. So the machine said it's a B. And then I said, no, it's... It, mm. So I actually went to the original scan in the book to check it out. And indeed, it is a B. So it's really magic. And But of course, if everything you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, it starts seeing letters in everything. So it gives me these things. And uh, well, but again, it's beautiful, right? So maybe something I have not been looking for. But of course, I was about deep dreaming. So this is then what happens if I feed, use this newly trained network on, uh, on, on material. And you can definitely see it takes an entirely different twist. It suddenly has this typographic feel to it. And uh, another example, um, not sure uh, if you recognize the lady on the left and the right. But it's actually the Mona Lisa in, uh, let's say, yeah, well, it has a lino cut uh, aspect to me. But yes, there's no more puppies involved at all. But OK, I, oh, one more thing. Yes, uh, Deep Dream has had, had this great opportunity in, the, in spring this year, where the Gray Area Foundation, located in uh, San Francisco, was doing a charity auction to fund their projects. And I was really honored that to be invited to contribute some artworks there. 
So I kind of ate my own dog food and created, like, tried to create something that is not obviously Deep Dream. So I created this piece called the Archimedes Principle, which well reminds me of a, a ball floating in water. But the one thing I didn't mention yet is my residency. And the reason is it just started. But I can tell you, I feel like a child in a candy store. It's really amazing. I have this huge amount of data to play with. I have kind of metadata. I can I have super smart people, much smarter than me, that I can ask extremely stupid questions. And I've already started working, but it's still something I, I want to fine tune. But I also had the privilege to see what Cyril is actually doing there for a while. And so, no further ado, I, I, let's get Cyril on stage uh, to, so he can show you some awesome things. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Wow. Okay. So, my name is Cyril Jan, and I'm a digital interaction artist. So, a question I get often is, what is a digital interaction artist? So it's actually very simple. I try to create poetic moments for people when they are interacting with digital systems. And the process is also fairly simple. It basically boils down to two steps. One step is just playing, really, just uh, like a kid, getting my hands on some technology and playing without any goal, just for the, the pleasure of learning new things and having fun. And then sometimes a poetic outcome appears. And what that lets you do is, for example, swing through the stars, or having your face covered with some generative masks, or creating a video of people dancing together, and so on and so on, a lot of things that I've been doing over the last years. But um, you might be wondering, OK, what about machine learning? It turns out. One year ago, I didn't know anything about machine learning. It all started when Damien came to me. He asked me, hi, Cyril, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, how are you? Not too bad. And he asked me, OK, what can you do with 7 million cultural artifacts? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I had to stop for a moment. Uh, what do you mean, 7 million cultural artifacts? What can I do? I said, yeah, well, the Cultural Institute has been working for several years with thousands of partners. We have this great database with amazing content. Well, what can you do with it? Well, I really had to stop because those are 7 million opportunities to uh, learn something new about the culture, about some events, really incredibly high quality content. So in order not to panic, I did what every coder would do in this situation. I loaded all the assets and plotted them in a scene wave, because then <laughs> I did not have to think about it anymore. That was done. And from there, well, I did the most obvious things. I started to plot them by time, by color, by medium. And well, you find some interesting things along the way. But you can't help but think, there's got to be more. All this great material, all this great technology, there's got to be more that we can get out of it. And so this is uh, where machine learning came across, especially when you go to Google um, every day. It doesn't take too long until someone points you to some amazing things. And so the first, the first, uh, one of the first experiments that we did is using a um, popular technology now, which is the of machine learning annotation. So it's the technology that allows you to find the photos that you took in the forest by tapping trees, my photos of Oh, the photos of my friend Tony, etc. But what about the less expected labels? The labels you would not think in the first place to write down. And what about less expected images as well? And images that you would not expect to find anywhere there. Well, we were curious as well, so we sent it all over to the, um, to the service. And when we got the results back, we were, well, I fell off my chair. I, I will show you. Can, can we hand over to the, get onto the demo? So basically, what we can see here is that we got back around 4,000 uh, different unique labels. And well, we, we had to spend hours. It was too amazing. The things that were detected were really incredible. Let's, let's go over one example that you would expect to work, because it does, but in quite an amazing way. So let's look for horses. There. OK. So 
as you can see, some beautiful artworks of horse. Let's, let's take this one, for example, beautiful painting from Xiaxia One. Well, it's quite incredible, because I don't know how he got his inspiration to picture um, horses from this angle, because I, I didn't even know it was possible, or how the machine ma managed to, to detect that it was a horse. But it does, and, it's, and well, it's quite amazing. And also, you get uh, examples after examples of, well, really incredible things like this, for example, calligraphic artwork of, again, a horse, but that really goes toward the abstract representation from Yuan Xikun. And again, a beautiful artwork, but it quite blows my mind that uh, now algorithms are capable of distinguishing this much amount of, um, of uh, details in these images. So I will, uh, unfortunately, I, w I can go over all those examples, but we are going to release this uh, online soon. So please take a day off to <laughs> go through all of them, because there are some pretty amazing examples. And we said now, OK, now that we realize it really works, what about more tricky examples? Like, for example, let's put something that leans toward emotion, like calm, for example. Let's have a look. Oh. Calm. Oop. There. So well, yeah, there is this thing where we didn't know what to expect when, when you click on the label and when you look at the content. And indeed, yes, I see, I understand your reference computer. These are indeed calm sceneries, beautiful landscapes with, yeah, it, it's peaceful. So as we went over and over, we came across also labels that we would have not thought to write down. Like, for example, one that I quite like. I didn't know it was a thing, but we found this lady in waiting collection automatically created and, crea and sent back by the algorithms. But look at this beautiful collection of incredible artworks from various centuries of, I don't know, maybe, I guess it was a thing, lady in waiting. Oh. Well, apart from that one, maybe. <laughs> OK. And then maybe one last example, this one. I really fell off my chair. <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. I was like, oh, what's going on? That must be some, some glitch. But then when it appeared, well, it just made sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's right. So yes, we'll uh, release this online soon. We have to polish a few things first. But wh what you can see is, yes, before the uh, neural net is able to um, label all these images, first he is representing all the images in um, highly dimensional world, let's say. But it really qualifies as the world. Basically, the neural net, to be able to apply those labels, he positioned every asset at a particular position in this world. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to visit that world. What does it look like? Is there, a, I don't know, an island of the Impressionists blue, with blue hats, or the highway of Roman statues? I don't know. But what I suggest is you hop on with me, and we just have a quick tour. I will give you a quick tour. OK. So let's start from these two assets here. Well, they seem to have in common that it, they are a landscape. But let's take a step back. We can see other artworks appearing with, uh, well, it looks like some series of yeah, landscapes, more landscapes. But if you look around, then we can see that we are actually surrounded. We really literally woke up in this. I don't know, the island of art. And well, let's, let's, have a, let's have a tour, actually. So here we can see yeah, a scene with um, animals, I guess. <laughs> As we continue, I think it's this direction. So let's, let's give it a little while for it to load. People start to appear in the picture, along with those animals. And if we step back even more, actually, let me take you to one of my favorite spots directly. <laughs> this one. I call it the shore of portraits. <laughs> Look at this. 
Let's give it a little while to load. Uh, and so this, sorry, I'm going really quick because we have a lot of things that <laughs> we want to show. But this is a um, TSNE map. So TSNE stands for uh, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which basically takes all those 128 dimensions and flattens it to just two dimensions so that you can plot them uh, and make, make it interactive and easier to, to travel across. So here is a simple, di very simplistic diagram that shows how you can create the map. So basically, we take the image, we fit it into the neural net, which extracts the raw features, which uh, is a 128 dimensional vector. Then in two steps, we reduce those dimensions to two, and then it becomes you, you choose the way you want to plot them. But um, this you can do now today with eight lines of Python. So it's not something that is yes, uh, reserved for uh, scientists or researchers. W thanks to some amazing open source libraries like sklearn, it is something you can do with eight lines of Python. You just load the CSV of your raw features. You, um, well, I won't go over all those lines, but you, you do a truncated SVD, which is the first step that reduces to 50 dimensions. And then the TSNE is able to uh, create this nice map of uh, two-dimensional vectors. And then, as we, sh we saw the, uh, the shore of portraits, we, we got an idea, which um, led to what we call the portrait matcher. So basically, the Cultural Institute has about, we detected in the art, art project channel, about 40,000 faces. So the question came quite naturally, what if you could browse this database with your own face? And it has to be real time, otherwise it did not happen. So can we switch back to the, to the demo? All right, let's try that. Let's see if it works. All right. So let's see. <laughs> oh, wow, OK. I think we might. <laughs> OK. So it, 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 we still have to polish this one a little bit. <laughs> But if you come to our lab in Paris, we have a much refined setup, which works much better. But anyway, let's move on. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> OK, can we switch back to the, to the slides? All right, but one good thing is that this uh, experiment led us to another iteration. Came, come, came from a, a, another popular thing that happens when you're in front of a painting, and you see someone drawn, and you feel like, oh, I feel like I know this person. Or, oh, that definitely looks like my neighbor, Tony. And actually, as it turns out, there is this great model that's been done by uh, some researchers at Google, uh, uh, which is called FaceNet. And this model is, a, is able to achieve 99.63% accuracy on the label face uh, in the wild, which is the academic de facto for this type of uh, research. So basically, this uh, neural net embeds in a Euclidean space uh, uh, faces that are from the same identity closer together than faces with di uh, dissimilar identities. So basically, same people are closer in this space than different people. And what it sends you back, basically, is, a, again, a 128-dimensional um, vector. The, that represents the embedding. And so, well, we had to give it a try. So who knows these guys? I don't, <laughs> OK. I was, OK, they are very popular in Europe, too. So well, we took them as a starting point. Let's try to find, uh, let's see how well this model performs. But let's not include in the mix other pictures of them, because I'm sure it would work, so that would be boring. What if instead we forced? the system to send us only pictures that are paintings. Well, again, I can tell you, when I saw the result, I fell off my chair. And yes, I did spend a lot of time on the ground during this residency. <laughs> OK, I'm really excited to press this next button. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, this is what we got back. <laughs> I mean, Jared in the middle, 
even though there is a, a huge, I mean, there is a, a gender mismatch, that could be his sister, right? <laughs> Or even Richard Hendricks, just on the right of him, like it even got the curliness of the hair. It is just amazing. So of course you can imagine from there how many tries we did. <laughs> Everyone wants to to find his doppelganger in the database. So, and here, who would have known that Richard Hendricks had a half-naked man <laughs> painted at the Tate Britain right now? <laughs> Let's take these guys for example. Some of my personal heroes. Let's see what we get. And there, again, even though this beautiful artwork from um, Shepard Ferry uh, for Obama campaign in 2008 is highly stylized with only four colors, the algorithm still managed to find the matching. And yes, the, that is quite amazing. Well, it would have not been fair not to try it with ourselves. <laughs> so we gave it a try here at I.O. And <laughs> sorry, Mario. <laughs> The blue suits you so well. <laughs> so yeah, this is really fun. And uh, yeah, uh, it, um, uh, thanks again for uh, Damien and everyone at the Cultural Institute for offering us this uh, really great opportunity. And I will hand it over to you again. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, Mario. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to, to work with these guys. And I'm very lucky, I guess. Uh, so what's next? Uh, so if you want to stay in touch with us, please download uh, our app. It's a, it's a way to, to keep a link with you. And um, our goal is to inspire you to try machine learning, too. So if you want to give it a try, uh, I highly recommend TensorFlow. It's an open, fra open source framework, easy to, to start with. As a tutorial, um, the one did by um, Mr. Carpati is really, really good. It really helps me to understand what's going on with machine learning. And the Cultural Institute is not the only team within Google that is really passionate about machine learning. So uh, for instance, there is the AMI initiative. And uh, the, this link uh, is really good reading. So I encourage you to try it. And the last one is about a team named Magenta. Uh, completely dedicated to generate art using machine learning. So, thanks you. Thanks you, everyone. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>